Welcome everyone. I'm Dominique, meanwhile an alumni of the Security and Privacy Lab at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. And my work with Rainer Böhme presented here studies how users react to constant dialogues that have become ubiquitous on the web. Dialogues that have asked for the purpose of data processing have been existing and researched for almost two decades. It all started in the browser. On the left, you can see Netscape's dialog allowing users to adjust cookie acceptance. This dialog has been studied in a Kai paper from 2001. The dialog on the right is more involved. It has been proposed by Patterson et al. in SOUPS 2005 as a means to make data protection more user-centric. As you can see, the user can control the data recipient, purposes, conditions and other details. To our knowledge, this dialogue never made it into a product, presumably because the level of detail is good for academic privacy researchers, but unusable for the average person. Both examples show that consent dialogues have been discussed and implemented long before the GDPR. However, it took the GDPR and its threat of sanctions to deploy such dialogues in practice and consequently revive this line of research. Here we see some common consent dialogues from today, which all of you are probably familiar with. They typically seek permission to store cookies, but the consent extends to and is required for many forms of personal processing related to the visit. Comparing old and new, we can see that current dialogues ask for multiple purposes of data processing. These purposes can be broadly divided into functional, analytical and marketing. This new aspect has motivated our empirical study. When looking at consent dialogues and cookie banners of popular websites, we observed common patterns. First, as already stated, the user often has to choose between multiple purposes. Second, we observed some cookie banners with a highlighted default button, which automatically accepts all purposes regardless of whether any checkboxes have been selected before the user clicks this button. This button does not increase choice options, but rather has the potential to trick users into accepting all purposes against their will. After observing these patterns in consent dialogues in late 2018, we were interested in which way these features influence users' effective choice and also their thoughts and feelings about the interaction. So, we decided to conduct a user study to find out. Since user studies integrate better into the body of knowledge if the links are derived from established theory, we revisit two relevant theories for explaining the effect. Specifically, we relate the multiple purpose selection in dialogues to the theory of choice proliferation. This theory says that the number of presented choices influences an individual's satisfaction with the decision. More options cause more stress, the tragedy of choice. Highlighted default buttons can be linked to the deception theory. Deception has mainly been studied in marketing and organizational research. The theory basically describes practices that potentially trigger decisions or opinions that individuals would have formed in a different way without the deceptive factor. Moreover, default buttons can be interpreted as a representation of a descriptive social norm. Therefore, an established principle in usability says that default options should present the most frequently selected settings in order to guide inexperienced users. As you might know, studying the effects of the GDPR is a popular research topic. Several concurrent studies have investigated user as well as website behavior with respect to consent dialogues. So what can we bring to the table? Most existing studies simply measure some behavior and then conclude prematurely in our opinion. For example, several authors suggest that so and so many websites practices are illegal. But how can they claim that one of the criteria of consent, freely given, unambiguous, informed, is not fulfilled if you don't ask the user? We try to avoid such shortcuts and position our study with three salient features. 
First, we use a deductive approach. This means we derive the behavioral outcome of a given feature, such as many checkboxes, from established theory. This improves generalizability, allows cross-checks against known covariates, and strengthens the confidence in our takeaways, also for untested dialogues. Second, and relatedly, we draw our conclusions based on user behavior and self-reported data. This allows us to learn more about user-specific factors, individual differences in response, and most importantly, learn about perceptions after we ensure that the user has understood how the dialogue functions. That is what purposes she effectively consented to. Without this information, contradicting explanations could not be disambiguated and conclusions would stand on weak foundations. Third, we use a controlled experiment, which promises gold standard causal insights. Doing this in a classroom rather than in the field ensures that self-selection and non-response bias are low. Specifically, our experiment went like this. We conducted two classroom experiments in two countries with 150 students in total. The experiment took place before a mandatory undergraduate lecture. First, we started with a briefing that did not reveal the purpose of our study. We just told the students that we want them to evaluate a flight search website. We asked them to visit a functional mockup and told them to search for a particular flight connection. All students started this task simultaneously. When visiting the website, it randomly presented the user one of the three consent dialogues, which I will present in detail later. At this point, we measure the participant's choice of purposes, as well as the click button. We then waited until all students were finished with the flight search. Then a key combination for opening a questionnaire was displayed on the lecture hall's main projector, so that participants started answering it almost simultaneously. The questionnaire first asks to freely list positive and negative aspects of the website. Then, participants should recall their chosen cookie settings in the consent dialog in free text form and afterwards in closed text form. The questionnaire also includes items on four established constructs, which I will explain later. At one point, we informed the participants on their effective choice in the cookie dialog and then repeat some questions in order to measure if they, for instance, regret their choice. Finally, after all participants had finished answering the questions, we debriefed them and disclosed the actual purpose of the study. As mentioned before, we divided our sample into three randomly assigned groups who saw different cookie dialogues. The treatment of the first group is a deceptive dialogue exactly as we saw it first on a large airline website. It contains an explanation text about different cookie settings, as well as three selectable purposes with checkboxes. The dialogue also includes an expandable part with more details about the categories and two buttons. The first button with Select All and Confirm is highlighted. The second is colorless and says Confirm Selection. The second treatment condition differs from the first one, as it does not have three, but only one selectable purpose. The third condition was presented to the control group of our study. It did not have a highlighted default button. So let's now move to our measurements and results. First, we simply counted the number of consented purposes and assigned a score ranging from 0 to 3 based on the number of selected checkboxes. We then compared the deception group with the control group. We find that the effect of the deceptive default button is significant in terms of the number of choices. Participants in the treatment group were also significantly more likely to consent to all three instead of two or less purposes than the control group. Thus, we can derive that if consent dialogues include a highlighted default button, users effectively consent to more purposes than without the button. The question we answer next is how people feel about this. One of the four constructs which we measured in the exit questionnaire was perceived deception. The item text asked users to state if they think 
that the website was dishonest about cookie settings, if it tries to mislead the user towards selecting settings they do not intend to, and if the website makes use of misleading tactics. All items were assessed on a semantic scale ranging from 1 to 5, which indicates participants' level of agreement to the statement. Here we find that the perceived deception of the group with the deceptive button is significantly higher than of the control group. This result first establishes users' negative attitudes towards this particular deceptive feature. It closes the gap between the observed behavior and potential legal interpretations. We also asked users to state to which degree they regret their choice of cookie settings and if they would change the settings afterwards if this was possible. Participants were asked these three questions at two points in time. First, before we informed them about their effective selection and again after they received this information. This way we were able to measure within subject differences. And indeed, we find a significant difference in the before and after measurements of regret within the deception group. In contrast, we do not find a significant difference in the control group that did not see the deceptive button. In a second step, we specifically compared participants who clicked the default button with those who clicked the other button. And we find that those who click the yellow button report even more regret after being informed about their actual consented purposes. The third construct we measured in the questionnaire is the perceived difficulty of responding to the consent dialog. Specifically, we asked users to state to which degree it was incomprehensible, frustrating and easy to select cookie settings. We asked this to find out if users can deal with multiple purposes at a time. When measuring the difference between the deception group and the group with the reduced choice options, we do not find significant differences. However, participants needed significantly more time to respond to the dialog if presented with more choices. This at least gives hope that users can deal with multiple purposes. You can find more things in the paper, but what's maybe worth mentioning here is the participants' overall privacy attitudes. Participants were asked to state if it is important for them to protect their online privacy and if they are concerned when websites use cookies. We find that participants with higher privacy attitudes actually show fewer purposes in both of the treatment groups. This challenges the privacy paradox and you can read in the paper how we interpret it. However, we do not find a significant difference in privacy attitudes between those participants who clicked the deceptive button and those who did not. Let me briefly comment on the limitations of this study. First, we conducted a classroom experiment with a mock-up website. Thus, participants may behave differently in the experiment than when dealing with real consent dialogues. To assess this potential bias, we asked for feedback and comments at the end of the questionnaire. Only one participant wrote that she accepted all cookies because she thought they were necessary for the experiment. We could not find further indications that participants might have perceived the website as artificial. Second, it is important to highlight that our sample is limited to German-speaking computer science students, so we assume that they are more educated about the functionality of cookies. However, if even users who have more knowledge about cookies than the average fall for these deceptive buttons, we must fear that the general public would be even more likely to get tricked by this design. To summarize the empirical takeaways, our results show that the highlighted default button which selects all purposes has several effects. First, users consent to more purposes. Second, users perceive the website as more deceptive. And third, users regret their choice more. These findings go in line with deception theory. Now turning to the theory of choice proliferation. Even though we found that the presented number of choices significantly impacted the response time, the fact that the respondents did not perceive it as more difficult indicates that most users can handle three different purposes without experiencing negative effects. Our empirical findings let us draw several practical conclusions. Many researchers have warned against using default buttons to nudge users into practices they do not like. While firms could get away with saying that such defaults may be in the interest of the user, 
our results show that this is often not the case. More regret and feeling deceived are clear signs of customer dissatisfaction, which responsible firms should try to minimize. This goes hand in hand with the GDPR's requirement of data protection by default. If a highlighted default button exists, it should reflect the most privacy-friendly option. While the law is intentionally silent on how exactly this should be implemented, a way forward would be to make available a set of best dialogues that firms can borrow. It's certainly not the legislator, but perhaps consumer rights organizations or privacy researchers to do this. All the wonderful results in usable privacy research remain useless or even counterproductive if firms build systems that do the opposite. Nevertheless, we are hesitant about calling for more regulation. At least in the EU, the GDPR already stipulates freely given, unambiguous and informed consent. We deem this as sufficient to support a court decision, perhaps drawing on empirical research like this one, which clarifies that the dialogue in question failed to meet all of these requirements. A middle ground could be to free websites from the burden of designing and administrating consent decisions. We currently witness the rapid uptake of consent management solutions by new and old intermediaries. Such consent managers may reduce user-borne privacy costs by offering a single point of intervention. However, if the intermediaries further enshrine the interest of the tracking industry, very little is gained. The last option is to go back to the client device, which could offer interfaces to manage and send consent signals for websites and, importantly, apps too. The lessons from prior attempts, such as P3P in the 2000s and Do Not Track in the 2010s, tell us that this works best if commercial websites are mandated to implement this standard and respect these signals. Now, if future browsers turn from mere user agents to privacy agents, we have completed one round of the Wheel of Reincarnation. Recall that the first example dialog I showed you at the beginning of this talk was on Netscape's cookie settings from the 1990s. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions.